In this video, we're going to explore and construct an algebraic structure known as the Witt algebra. So this algebra was first discovered by Cartan in 1909, and then Witt did some stuff with it in the 1930s. I would file this video under, I wish I could make all the videos in my channel on subjects like this, but I don't think the viewership is there for it. So maybe post in the comments if you'd like me to make more videos like this. So we're going to start with the algebra of Laurent polynomials. So what do I mean by Laurent polynomials? Those are polynomials with complex coefficients, and they really have two interconnected variables, and those variables are z and 1 over z. So you can kind of think of these as two different variables, but they're connected by the fact that z times z inverse or z times 1 over z is in fact just equal to the number 1. So let's look at some examples of elements in c adjoins z, z inverse or the ring of Laurent polynomials. So one example would be 3z plus 2z squared. That's an example of an element in there. Maybe 1 over z to the fifth plus 2 plus i plus z to the ninth. That's an element in there as well. Notice we've got a z, 1 over z to the fifth term, a constant term, which is complex in this case, and then also a z to the ninth term. And you can write down a bunch more examples like this if you want to. Okay, but this algebra of Laurent polynomials is not itself the Witt algebra, but it's in fact a natural space that the Witt algebra acts on. So from here, we want to suppose that we have a special map on this algebra of Laurent polynomials. So I'm going to call this map D, and it goes from C, Z, Z inverse, in other words, from the algebra of Laurent polynomials to itself. And we want to assume some conditions on this map. So first of all, it must be linear. So what do we mean by linear? Well, just think about linear transformations from linear algebra. Well, this algebra of Laurent polynomials is in fact a vector space. Notice it's a vector space with a basis given by all powers of z. So the linearity can really be described in terms of that basis. Or we could describe it like this. So we have D evaluated on A of Z plus B of Z is equal to D evaluated at A of Z plus D evaluated at B of Z. So that's one condition of linearity. It splits up addition in this method. And then we've also got another condition of linearity which involves scalar multiplication and our scalars here are complex numbers. So this is a complex vector space. So we've got D of C times A of Z where C is a real number is equal to C times D of A of Z. So those are our two conditions of linearity. And then maybe we should point out where all of these parts come from. So let's see, a of z and b of z come from this algebra of Laurent polynomials. So c, z, z inverse. So there are things like these guys up here. And then the number c is a complex number. But that's not the only condition that this map D has to satisfy. It also has to satisfy a property which makes it a derivation. And that's a Leibniz rule. So let's write that down. So the Leibniz rule is that D evaluated at A of Z times B of Z equals A of Z times D evaluated at B of Z plus d evaluated at a of z times b of z. So if you look carefully like th at this, this looks like the product rule from calculus. Notice we're evaluating these one at a time and then we're summing it up. So to reiterate what we have going on here, we have Laurent polynomials, they're objects of this form, and then we've got a map on this space of Laurent polynomials that's both linear and it satisfies this Leibniz rule. And all maps like this can be put together into a 
certain object called the derivations of these Laurent polynomials. So these are all called derivations. And in this case, these are derivations of the Laurent polynomials. And this is in fact one of the classic ways to describe the Witt algebra. So we'll describe the Witt algebra over here. This will be our definition. So the Witt algebra, which I'll just call Witt, is actually the space of derivations, which I'll just call DER of Laurent polynomials. So that'll be Z to Z inverse. So what is that? So that's gonna be all linear maps D from C, Z, Z inverse back to itself, such that D of A, B equals D of A times B plus A times D of B, where I've shortened A of Z just to A and B of Z just to B like that. So to reiterate, the space of derivations is exactly the Witt algebra. But we're not going to stop there. We're going to investigate the structure of derivations on this algebra of Laurent polynomials so that we can maybe get a finer view of this structure of Witt. So let's maybe get rid of this and we'll start to work towards that goal. So in the last board, we got a formal definition of the Witt algebra as the derivations of the Laurent polynomial ring on one variable, C, Z, Z inverse. So our first goal is to classify these derivations on this Laurent polynomial ring. So let's do that. So let's suppose that we have a derivation and let's first of all see what it does to constants and then we'll see what it does to powers of z. So maybe let's make that be our first question. What is d evaluated at c if c is just a constant? So if you think about the word that we're using here, the word derivations, and derivation sounds like derivative, and they satisfy this Leibniz rule, which is essentially the product rule for the derivative that you learned in calculus, you might think that the derivations applied to a constant should be equal to zero. And in fact, we'll show that that is the case, but we'll show it just using this formal definition of a derivation. Okay, so let's do that. So we've got D of C, that's going to be the same thing as, as D of C times the number one. But now we can factor a C out of this, given that this is a linear map. So this is going to be C of D of one, but I'll rewrite one as one times one. But then on the other hand, I can apply the Leibniz rule to this one times one. That'll give me C of one times D of one plus D of one times one. Just recall the product rule. But now notice this is two copies of the same thing. So we can add them together and we'll get two times C of D evaluated at one. We can bring that C back inside using linearity and we'll get two times D of C. But let's see what we've got. We've got D evaluated at our constant C is equal to twice D evaluated at our constant C. We can subtract this D evaluated at C from both sides and we'll very quickly see that D evaluated at a constant C is equal to zero. Okay, so that's a really good place to start. And now from here, maybe we should see what does D do to certain powers of Z. So we'll start with maybe a basic case, which is D evaluated at Z squared. That's a simple enough example to work through pretty easily, but it's general enough that it'll give us a guess for what's going on in general that we can then prove with induction. So we're gonna use the same trick as we did up there. So we'll take D evaluated at Z squared and write it as D evaluated at Z times Z then apply the Leibniz rule there. That'll give us Z times D evaluated at Z plus D evaluated at Z times Z. 
those are exactly the same. Notice we get two times z times d evaluated at z. But now we've got something that looks a little bit like the power rule. The derivative of z squared is equal to two times z. It just ends up that we need this d of z tacked on at the end. And you might say, well, what are the possible values of d of z? But it turns out that there's nothing that we can do to take this z and write it as something simpler in order to get a restriction on d evaluated at z to the first power. So this is like some sort of free object here. It is in fact allowed to be anything in the Laurent polynomial ring z, z inverse. So looking back on this, we see that d of z squared is two times z times this other bit. We've got the power rule times this other bit. Maybe that gives us some motivation that all of these things should look like the power rule. That's exactly what we'll prove now. So I've summarized and generalized what we saw on the last board with the following claim. For all n bigger than or equal to one, d evaluated at z to the n is n times z to the n minus one times d evaluated at z, where recall d is any derivation on the Laurent polynomial ring. And by our discussion before, this value right here is really free to be any Laurent polynomial. So how could we prove this? Well, since this is something that's true for all natural numbers, essentially, a proof by induction is probably a nice way to do that. Notice that the base case is taken care of by what we saw on the last board, the n equals two case. So we might as well just jump into the induction hypothesis. So let's suppose for some k bigger than or equal to one, we have d evaluated at z to the k is equal to k times z to the k minus one times d evaluated at z. And then we'll consider the next case. So and consider d evaluated at z to the k plus one. Now we'll play the same game that we did before, factoring z to the k plus one, and then applying the Leibniz rule. So this is d of z times z to the k. So that's the factorization of z to the k plus one. Then the Leibniz rule tells us that that is z times d of z to the k plus z to the k times d of z. Again, using this thing that we've called the Leibniz rule, which is essentially the most important part of the definition of a derivation. Now we can apply our induction hypothesis to this guy right here, and we'll have z times k times z to the k minus one times d of z. And then we have this other copy, z to the k times d of z. But now let's notice that this z will multiply in here and it will cancel that k minus one to just a k. So let's do that. So those will take care of each other. And then we'll have k times z to the k plus one times z to the k. That gives us k plus one times z to the k times d evaluated at z. But that's exactly what we needed to do in order to finish this proof by induction of this claim. But this isn't all we need. We also need to state and prove a similar claim for negative values of n. So let's change that up right now. So the claim for negative values of n will take the similar form just with n less than or equal to negative one. Okay, so let's maybe tackle this. We won't really need to do induction because we can use the fact that we know quite a bit of information from the positive case. So since n is less than or equal to one, we can set n equal to minus m for m bigger than or equal to one then we'll use the fact that we know the derivative of z to the m or the derivation applied to z to the m. And now we'll notice that zero is the derivation applied to one, but we can rewrite one as z to the m times z to the minus m. Next up, we can apply our derivation to this. 
So this is going to be the derivation applied to z to the m times z to the minus m plus the derivation applied to z to the minus m times z to the m. But now we know one of these, but not the other. We know this by our previous claim, and we want to know the value of this. So like I said, we'll apply our previous claim, which was proven with induction, to that thing that I've underlined in purple. That's going to give us m times z to the m minus 1 times d evaluated at z, and then that's going to be times z to the minus m. And then we still have plus. I'm going to rewrite this a little bit as z to the m d z to the minus m. And again, that is all equal to zero, just bringing this zero down here. So let's see a little bit of simplification that we can do. So let's notice that this z to the minus m will cancel this m in the exponent out. Then maybe we can move some things around and we have z to the m d z to the minus m is equal to minus m times d of z over z. But now we can divide both sides by z to the m. That will have the effect of changing this to m plus 1. But let's rewrite this a little bit. Let's notice that that is equal to minus m z to the minus m minus 1 d of z. But now we could rewrite this all in terms of our n. And notice we have exactly what we need. So z to the minus m is the same thing as z to the n. And then this minus m will be equal to n right here. And here this is n minus 1. But now we have n is negative. So we have the same formula as holding for n positive and negative. So now let's get rid of this claim and make a little nice observation that comes quickly from these last two claims. Up to this point, we've shown that derivations on the algebra of Laurent polynomials act a lot like the normal derivative. So they satisfy the same power rule with the addition of the evaluation at z, as we saw. And we can put all of that stuff that we proved together into the following corollary. So for all Laurent polynomials, which I'll call them a of z, the derivation applied to a of z is really just the derivative of a with respect to z times the derivation of z, where as we said before, this derivation of z is really any Laurent polynomial. So any Laurent polynomial is possible here. And how do we know that? Well, given the fact that d goes from Laurent polynomials to Laurent polynomials, we know that d must take z to a Laurent polynomial. But furthermore, anything that operates like this ends up being a derivation, regardless of which Laurent polynomial you pick. So that really tells us that we've got full freedom here. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's prove this equation. So let's maybe take an expansion of a of z. So let's write it like this. This will be the sum as n goes from minus, maybe we'll call it m1, all the way up to m2 of a sub n z to the n. Okay, so that would be a nice way to write a Laurent polynomial. So it goes from like the smallest negative exponent to the largest positive exponent. Okay, so now let's take d evaluated at a of z. And notice by linearity, we can rewrite this as the sum as n goes from minus m1 all the way up to m2 of a sub n, d evaluated at z to the n. We can apply our claim to this d evaluated at z to the n to give us our sum. I'll leave off the indices here. And then we'll have n times z to the n minus 1 times a n times d of z. Now we can factor a d of z out of that whole thing because that is a common term for all of these. And we'll have d of z times the sum as n goes from minus m1 all the way up to m2 of n times a sub n times z to the n minus 1.
but that's exactly the derivative of our original Laurent polynomial A. So this is going to be equal to dA dz times d evaluated at z. Okay, now that we've taken care of that, let's state the final form of an arbitrary derivation on the ring of Laurent polynomials, then see if that we can find a basis for those derivations. We've made good headway so far. We've shown that the Witt algebra, in other words, the algebra of derivations on Laurent polynomials, is made up of objects of the following form. So we have p of z times the derivative d by dz. So that's written a little bit differently than we had before, but this is equivalent. And here p of z is any Laurent polynomial. So you might say, well, how is that equivalent to what we had before? Well, let's recall that we showed that derivations have the following action. So d on a of z was equal to dA dz times d evaluated at z, but I can rewrite that as d evaluated at z, and then the derivative with respect to z of a of z. And then I can rename this d evaluated at z as some arbitrary Laurent polynomial, where maybe this Laurent polynomial is the one that defines this derivation. So that's, in essence, how I'm able to write that all elements of this Witt algebra are of this form. Okay, so our second goal is to find a nice basis of this Witt algebra. Well, let's notice that every element of the Witt algebra is connected to a Laurent polynomial. So that means we can take a basis for Laurent polynomials, so that would be C, Z, Z inverse, and kind of obviously push that to a basis for the Witt algebra. So what's a basis for the Laurent polynomials? Well, it is an infinite dimensional vector space, but it kind of has an obvious basis. So maybe in the middle would be just the number one. So that gives us all constant terms. And then we've got the first power of z, the second power of z, z cubed, and so on and so forth down in that direction. Then going up in this direction, we have z inverse, z to the minus 2, z to the minus 3, and so on and so forth back up there. So like I said, it's an infinite dimensional vector space, but every Laurent polynomial can be written as a finite linear combination of these powers of z. And now we can map each of these over to basis elements for width as follows. So one would maybe go to just the derivative. So the derivative is clearly a derivation. And then z could go to z times the derivative. z squared would go to z squared times the derivative. Then we have z cubed times the derivative and so on and so forth down that way. Then furthermore, we can go back up. We'll have z inverse times the derivative, z to the minus 2 times the derivative, and so on and so forth back up that way. So since every polynomial or Laurent polynomial gives rise to a different derivation, and every derivation gives us a unique Laurent polynomial, then that means the basis for the Laurent polynomials will obviously give rise to this basis over here for the Witt algebra. Okay, so that achieves our second goal of finding a nice basis for Witt. And now from here, I'll give these basis elements over here on the right, maybe their classic names, and then we'll look at the algebraic structure that this Witt algebra has. Notice at this point, we've just really been working at, with it as a vector space without any additional structure. But now we want to endow it with some additional structure. So we just got done finding a basis for this Witt algebra. And the basis involved derivations that were powers of z times the derivative operator. And now I'll introduce a naming scheme for those basis vectors. And this is maybe the classic naming scheme. 
So for integers n, we'll define L sub n to be minus z to the n plus one d by dz. So it's that derivation attached to this minus z to the n plus one. Notice I've scaled this a little bit differently than you might have thought. It might seem obvious to define L of n just to be z to the n d by dz, but we'll see that this naming gives it some nice structure as we move forwards. And so clearly these L sub n's form a basis for wit, given that we had a basis on the last board. And this is just maybe a rescaling by a minus one and then a re-indexing a little bit of that basis that we saw before. That really brings us to the following question. And can we give this some additional structure? So I've been calling this the wit algebra. And let's recall that an algebra, either associative or non-associative, is a vector space with some sort of product endowed on it so that we can multiply vectors in that vector space to get a new vector in that vector space. At this stage, we only have a vector space structure on wit. Now we want to define some sort of product structure that makes it into an algebra. And as we'll see, it will not be an associative algebra. So maybe the first thing that we'd like to do is see, can we just like straight up multiply or really rather compose the elements from the wit algebra to get a new element from the wit algebra? So let's try that. So maybe I'll just call this our first try at combining elements from the wit algebra to get a new element from the wit algebra. So let's look at L, M, L, N. And in order to get a handle on what that is, we need to apply that combination of elements to a Laurent polynomial A of Z. So let's see what that is. That'll be LM applied to minus Z to the N plus one, A prime of Z, because that's the derivative of A of Z. I'll use that prime shorthand. But now that's gonna be equal to Z to the M plus one, the derivative with respect to Z of Z to the N plus one, A prime of Z where I've taken the minus sign that's in the definition of LM and canceled it out with this minus sign. But let's see what we need to do here. We've got this derivative, and then here we have the product of two Laurent polynomials. One Laurent polynomial is this z to the n plus one, and the other one is this derivative of this a of z Laurent polynomial. So that means we need to apply the product rule or the Leibniz rule. So that'll give us z to the m plus one, and then this will split into two parts. n plus one times z to the n, a prime of z. So that's like taking the derivative of the z to the n plus one part. And then we'll have this is plus z to the n plus one, a double prime of z. But this second derivative here is problematic. So before we showed that all derivations of Laurent polynomials were in fact polynomials times first derivatives. But since we have a second derivative here and not a first derivative, that means that this is not a derivation. So what that tells us is that if we do this composition of LM with LN, we do not get an element of the wit algebra. So that's kind of a bummer. So maybe we need another try at combining two of these derivations to get a new derivation. And maybe the hint of what our second try should be lies in what happens with this second derivative. Notice that if we were to just extract the parts of this second derivative, we would have z to the m plus n plus 2 times the second derivative of a. But that's exactly the type of term we would get if we did this in the opposite order. 
So that gives us some motivation to maybe, instead of looking at this composition, look at the commutator of these two. And that's exactly what we'll do on the next board. We just got done showing that the composition of two derivations on Laurent polynomials was not a new derivation. So in other words, if we compose two elements from the Witt algebra, we do not get a new element from the Witt algebra. But if instead of composing them, we take the commutator of two elements from the Witt algebra or two derivations, we do end up getting a derivation. And that can be summarized in this following proposition. So for all integers m and n, the commutator lm ln is m minus n lm plus n. And I just want to point out that we're using kind of the semi-standard notation that if you take the commutator of two derivations d1 and d2, this is the same thing as d1 d2 minus d2 d1. And this kind of action is not unique to derivations of the Laurent polynomials. It turns out that if you take derivations of any algebra, they form a closed structure under this type of operation. Okay, so let's prove this real quick. So in order to prove this, we need to see that the left hand and the right hand side have the same action on a Laurent polynomial. So let's take some arbitrary a of z from c adjoins z, z inverse. So in, in other words, it's an arbitrary Laurent polynomial. Now let's calculate l, m, l, n on a of z. Let's notice that that is l, m, l, n on a of z minus l, n, l, m on a of z. Now we calculated one of these on the last board, but we'll run through it again real quick. So this is gonna be LM and then minus ZN plus one A prime of Z. So that's the action of LN on A of Z. And then this is gonna be LN minus Z to the M plus one A prime of Z. So that's the action of LM on A of Z. But now LM and LN are derivations that are defined as follows. LM is minus Z to the M plus one, the derivative with respect to Z. So that derivative needs to apply to this. And LN is Z to the N plus one, the derivative with respect to Z. And we can maybe cancel the minus sign that was here with this minus sign. So really we had three minuses here, we have two minuses here, maybe let these cancel, we're left with this. Now we can apply the product rule or the Leibniz rule to both parts here. So this will be z to the m plus one, and then here we'll have n plus one, z to the n, a prime of z, so that's from taking the derivative of this, plus z to the n plus one, a double prime of z. That a double prime was why the just straight composition was not a derivation. And then symmetrically over here, we have minus z to the n plus one. Then we have m plus one, z to the m, a prime of z. And then finally, plus z to the m plus one, a double prime of z. Now, as we kind of hinted toward on the last board, we've got z to the m plus one times z to the n plus one, a double prime from this first term. Then from the second bit, we have the same thing times a double prime. So that means this guy right here cancels with this guy right here, which is good. Our second derivative cancels, which means we only have a first derivative left which means we have a derivation now. Now it's just a matter of finding out which derivation do we have. So let's see, this is gonna be equal to minus m plus n. So that's what we get here. This is minus m plus n. Now notice we have one minus one, so those cancel. And then we'll have z to the m plus n plus one. And that happens for both of these. We have z to the m plus one times z to the n and z to the n plus one times z to the m. And then we've got a prime of z.
but we can finally take this minus sign and factor it out. And that leaves us with minus m minus n, z to the m plus n plus one, a prime of z. But let's see, that is exactly minus m minus n, l m plus n applied to a of z. But that's exactly where we needed to end up to show this commutation relation. Okay, so let's maybe get rid of this calculation and we will summarize everything that we've seen. So let's finish off with a bit of a summary. So let's recall we first defined the Witt algebra to be the space of all derivations on Laurent polynomials. So recall that derivations were linear maps, so they were linear transformations that satisfied some certain Leibniz rule, which looked like the product rule from calculus. Then we built a basis. We called those basis vectors L sub n, where L sub n was equal to minus z to the n plus one d by dz. So these are all examples of derivations. And in fact, every derivation can be written as a finite linear combination of these L's. Now, this algebra, so this Witt algebra, is actually an example of an infinite dimensional Lie algebra. And its Lie bracket is given by LMLN is equal to M minus N LM plus N. And then furthermore, maybe looking towards the future, the central extension of the Witt algebra is called the Virasoro algebra, and it's very important in physics and mathematical physics, so like string theory or conformal field theory. And this L0 component, so like this Ln but with n equals 0, is actually related to the Hamiltonian operator in physics. So maybe post in the comments if you guys want to see a follow-up video where we look at the Virasoro algebra. And that's a good place to stop.